to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ son of man can these bones live so i answered O oh Lord, you know. Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 3. Welcome to our study of Old Testament lessons. This lesson specifically in Ezekiel chapter 37 is an amazing context where God causes dry bones to come to life and it shows to Israel and by application to us that no matter how bleak the situation may be, no matter how dark it may look, if we'll turn to God and do what he says, God is able to restore hope and to give us a renewed sense of diligence in following him. Now the context of Ezekiel 37 is a very challenging context. God had been very patient and very long-suffering with Israel and time and time again he'd given them second chances. For example, in the book of Exodus, right after God brings them out of Egyptian bondage, God brings them headed toward the promised land. God hears the people begin to complain and murmur. They've just dried off from the Red Sea or they've just got out of the Red Sea. The Egyptians have just been drowned in it. And now they begin to complain and murmur and they say to God, Oh, that we were back in Egypt. Why have you brought us out here to, to kill us? How saddened that must have made God when he realized their weakness and their lack of faith. Think of another example, Exodus chapter 32. God is on the mountain delivering the Ten Commandments to Moses and the people are down waiting and they get impatient. They think something's happened to Moses and so they take their gold and they make golden calves and they begin to worship that. Can you imagine how God must have felt? Numbers chapter 13, God promises, and he's already proven himself. He has promised to defeat their enemies, and so they, they send in the spies to spy out the land. Ten of them come back and they say, it is a wonderful land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, but we look like grasshoppers in our own sight, and I know we do in theirs, they say in essence. And so they don't put their trust in God. Think about in Judges chapter 2, God strictly warns the people, want you to worship me, and me alone. And yet in just a few chapters later, you begin to see the people, they're on every hill, they're on every mountain, worshiping the Baals and the Ashtoreths. And yet God, again, gives them chance and chance again. Finally though, the long suffering of God came to an end. In Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 8 through 12, God promises that there is going to be 70 years of harsh captivity, that Babylon is going to come, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come, take God's people captive, and there's going to be great destruction. Just as God promised, as a result of the people's sins, God did sin the nation of Israel into captivity. And it's at this point in Israel's history that we, we now look. It looks like hope is going to be lost. The land and the state of Israel, it's been completely obliterated. Their king, he's been captured, he's been blinded, he's been sent to Babylon to die. Thousands of people have been violently slaughtered and left in the field for the carrion and the bird of the air. The heart of the Jewish nation, no doubt, has been carried to Babylon. Jerusalem is leveled to a pile of stones and ashes. And that beautiful temple has been completely plundered and burned. And so naturally, the Israelite is thinking to himself, how can there be any hope? How can we come out of this bleak situation? And yet, in the midst of this situation, this bleak and this hopeless picture, God sends forth hope and restoration. And thus, the practical application for us is, when it looks hopeless, when the situation looks bleak, if we will turn to God and do what He says, there is always a chance that hope can be restored. As we think about Ezekiel chapter 37, 
Let's first notice the context and then some practical application. We see in verses 1 and 2, God now presents Ezekiel with this picture of the valley of dry bones. Notice the scene. Ezekiel 37 verse 1 says, The hand of the Lord came upon me, and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and they were very dry. Here's Ezekiel, and he sees this, this amazing scene. God puts him in the valley, and you can look out on the valley, and there are great many bones, and they are very dry. That was representative of the great slaughter of Israel and their spiritual state. Very dry, many died. In fact, the bones are still there. No one even cared enough to bury them. God didn't cover them. Nobody else covered them. They're there for predator and vulture alike to feed upon. What did Israel, what did it remind Ezekiel of in verses 1 and 2? God would not tolerate the sin of Israel and there was a judgment day for Israel. God promised, you keep this up, you don't repent, and your time's going to come. And so as he sees this valley, no doubt he's reminded of their slaughter. But then there's a great question asked in verse 3, can these bones live? Notice Ezekiel 37 verse 3. The text says, And God, he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered and said, Oh, Lord God, you know. In the bleakest of situations, here's Ezekiel. He's in this valley viewing, viewing these skulls, the, all the bones, all the horrible aftermath. And God says, Ezekiel, you see all those skulls and, and backbones and hands and feet? Can they live? And Ezekiel says, Lord God, you know. From a human standpoint, Ezekiel says, that's impossible. And yet, with God... All things are possible. Luke chapter 1 verse 37. This reminds Ezekiel and gets him thinking about although there's been a great aftermath, a, a great destruction, he can see all that went on, there's still hope. All is not lost. Don't give up. Get right with me, God says, and I'll restore those things to you. And then we have in Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 4 through 14, the heart of our context where we see that that resurrection of the Israelite nation, the bones come to life. Notice the text. The Bible says in verse 4, Again God said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy to them and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and performed it. Here God makes that, that great prophecy to Israel, to, to Ezekiel. Ezekiel is commissioned to prophesy and he says to, to the dead bones, live. And can you, can't you just see it in your mind? Out of this great army, this great uh, valley of dry bones, there begins to be a rattling. 
And the bones began to come together, bone on bone, sinew on sinew, flesh on flesh. And before you know it, you no longer have an army of the dead. You have an army of the living. And so God shows Ezekiel and proves to the Israelite nation he's willing to restore them. They say, our hope's lost. God says, no, it's not. You put your trust in me. You realize I'm the Lord. I'll take you into the land of Israel. I'll put my spirit back in you. We'll have that relationship that we once had. Now, as you think about this scene, and as we think about New Testament Christianity today, what does the message of Ezekiel 37 about a, a valley of dry bones, what's that have to do with us? What lessons can we learn from this context? First, just as they learned, so we learn, sin brings spiritual death. You see verses 1 and 2, and as Ezekiel looks out on that valley of dry bones that are very dry, he's reminded, look at what God had to do to teach our people a lesson about sin. Friends, sin always brings spiritual death. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3 verse 10. And the Bible tells us, just as they were reminded then, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 23. The soul who sins shall surely die. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4. And we need to be reminded today that we face spiritual death because of our own choices. I don't face spiritual death because of what Adam and Eve did, because of what Israel did in Ezekiel 37. I have to deal with this because of my own sin. Notice the words of Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. The scripture says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, watch this now, and thus death spread to all men. Why? Because Adam sinned? Uh-uh. Because all have sinned. We have all sinned and fallen short, and thus we need to be reminded of the horrible effects of sin. There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. All have had to deal with it. Ecclesiastes 7.20, and remember the words of Proverbs 13, verse 5. The way of the transgressor, Proverbs 15, verse 3, the way of the transgressor is hard. Revelation 21, 8, it is the hardest, most difficult life you could ever imagine. First lesson, don't ever forget it. Sin always brings spiritual death. Secondly, Ezekiel was reminded, and so we are today, that the disobedient will be punished. Whose bones are those in that dry valley? Who, whose dry bones are those in that valley? Who are these people who are, are coming to life again? Some of these people are the very ones who were up on the mountaintop worshiping idols and not serving God. These are the disobedient that God punishes. Friend, God has promised today the disobedient will be punished. Matthew 25, 46, Jesus said, the righteous will go away into eternal life and the unrighteous into eternal condemnation. Hebrews 10, 29 and chapter 12, verse 31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God for our God is a consuming fire. We don't want to be punished by God because it will be horrible. In fact, Nahum 1, verse 7 says, God will not at all acquit the wicked. There's not going to be a guilty verdict and someone get off. Jesus clearly taught us if we've not lived right and done right, we'll spend eternity in that place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Mark chapter 9 and verse 44. In fact, in that great resurrection day, there's going to also be a great separation for those who were not faithful to God. Look at what Jesus said in John chapter 5. Verses 28 and 29. Jesus here says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. God has promised there is going to be a resurrection. And if you don't do right, you will spend eternity with the devil. And so we're reminded disobedient people will be punished and thus we must 
obey God. A third lesson learned practically from Ezekiel 37 is that God is a long-suffering God toward mankind. Now again, think about all Israel's done. How they've played the harlot, how they've stabbed God in the back, how they haven't put their trust in Him, and yet now God says one more time, if you'll just turn to me, hear my word, and do what I say, I'll bring life to these bones. Oh, how we need to be reminded that God is long-suffering and God is the God of second chances. If anyone's in Christ, He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. God doesn't want anyone to be lost. 1 Timothy 2, 4, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, the Bible says in Lamentations 3, verses 20 and 21, that it's through the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. Think about Genesis 3. Think about Genesis 6. God could have wiped people out then for their sin, and yet God's long-suffering. He gives them chance and chance again. But you know, practically speaking, hasn't He given each one of us chance and chance again? I've not lived perfect, and you've not lived perfect. We've all made mistakes, and we've all done things that we know are not right. If God at that point would have wiped us out, how sad that would have been. But look at the long-suffering of God. In fact, notice what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Bible says this, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's the long-suffering of God. God doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants all to repent. And so Ezekiel's reminded, and so are we, of the long-suffering of God. But you know, there's also another very practical lesson here. And in this text, we learn the great value and power in proclaiming the Word of God. What does God say to Ezekiel in verse 4, verse 7, and verse 9? God says, Son of man, prophesy to these bones. And when Ezekiel prophesies the Word of God, those bones come to life. Now, we're not in the age of prophesying, but we do preach the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 14, how beautiful are those who proclaim glad tidings of good things. We're told to preach the Word. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. The Bible says we're to speak as the oracles of God and just as Ezekiel spoke the Word and those bones come to life, when we preach the Word of God and people obey it, it brings new life to them. Notice where the power is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. The scripture says, For since the, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who were lost. God chose preaching the gospel as that powerful tool by which people are saved. Not drama, not skits, not acting, preaching the word. God said to Jonah, preach the preaching that I bid you. Oh, how we need that message today. And friend, listen carefully. There is a lost and dying world who desperately needs hope in the message of God in salvation of Christ. Another lesson we learn is that there is great power as well in God's word. Now we kind of saw this in the first part, but look at what happens when Ezekiel preaches the message. Ezekiel prophesies to them and dead bones come to life. Oh, how the word of God today is so powerful. James 1.21 tells us to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Romans 1.16 says the gospel is God's power unto salvation. Jeremiah in Jeremiah 22 verse 29 cried out, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. And when they did hear it, God's word was like that hammer which breaks the hard heart open. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15 verse 16, your words were found and I did eat them and they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. And don't you remember what Jesus said? Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. I think often of the words of Hebrews 4, verse 12. They tell us of the great power and impact the word of God can have in our life. Notice what the Bible says here. 
The scripture says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Where's the power? It's in the word of God when it is applied to my life. It causes me to be born again. 1 Peter 1, verses 23 through 25. Now, here's another lesson we also must learn from Ezekiel 37, and that is we must never lose hope in God and His power. The people said, our hope is lost, we're cut off. In Ezekiel 37, verses 10 following. And yet God says, no, you're not. There's still hope if you'll put your trust in me. Titus 1, verse 2 tells us that we're living in hope of eternal life. Hebrews 6, verse 18, God has made us that promise which he cannot lie. The Bible says in Romans 5, verse 5, that we're saved in hope. Romans 8, 24, that hope doesn't disappoint. We have the, the hope of heaven, the hope of the resurrection, the, the hope that one day we're going to live with God. And when we say hope, we're not talking about like someone says, well, I sure hope it rains tomorrow. That's not what biblical hope is. Biblical hope is assured anticipation. We're saved in hope. Hope does not disappoint. If hope doesn't disappoint, then it's sure. If we're living in view of hope, it's something we anticipate. And so it's that assured anticipation. I know it's going to happen, and thus I'm longingly anticipating that. I'm living my life in view of the resurrection, in view of being in heaven with God, knowing that things will be so much better there. And so don't ever, ever lose hope in God and His power. Another very practical lesson from Ezekiel 37 is that nothing is impossible for God. Verse 12 clearly teaches us, God said to the bones, live. He said in verse 12, the Spirit come in you, and those bones began to live, and there's this great army now, not of the dead, but of the living. How true it is today that nothing is impossible for our God. Think about it. Our God sent His own Son to die for a lost world. He so loved the world. John 3, 16, God is able to remove all our sins and forgive us. Psalm 130 verses 4 through 5. God is more than willing and able to raise those who have passed on out of the grave and bring them to Himself. Luke 137 says it rightly. With God, nothing is impossible. We serve a God whose power has no limit. And also we notice that God Himself will keep His promises. In verse 14, God says to the people, just as I've said, so it's going to be, I'm going to restore you. Well, the same is true with the God we serve. God cannot lie. Hebrews 13, 8, Malachi 3, verse 6, Hebrews 6, 18. God can't lie. It's against His very nature. He's promised that to us and it is sure. When God promises a person forgiveness, that person doesn't have to guess or wonder if God's really going to give that to him. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 28, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. When God promises someone eternal life, we don't have to wonder about that. When Jesus said the righteous will go away into eternal life, we can be sure of that. When God promises that old things have been passed away, all has become new, we can be sure in the promises of God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not going to change. Now, another very practical lesson we note from the Scripture is that God wants us to know Him and to obey His power. There's a key phrase in the book of Ezekiel and it occurs twice in this text, in verse 6 and verse 13, and it occurs multiple times in the book of Ezekiel. God says throughout the book that you may know that I am the Lord. God wants His people to know Him, know His power, and obey Him. You look at the examples of God in the Old Testament. God caused a great flood to come on the world in Genesis 6. And only eight souls were saved in the ark. God spares Joseph, brings him into Potiphar's house. You look at all that was done. Look at Elijah and the prophets of Baal, how God brought, brought a great victory there. And then you open to the New Testament and you see the miracles of Jesus. Raises dead Lazarus, walks on the sea with just a few fish and a few loaves, feeds 5,000. What's all that about? That they may know that I am the Lord. God wants us to know His power and to obey Him.
It's not just enough to say, I believe in Jesus. You've got to obey God to really know Him. Jesus said, it's not everybody who looks up in heaven and says, Lord, Lord, but he who does the will of my Father. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If I'm going to know God and have a relationship with Him, I must submit to His will and obey Him. Now, one final principle from Ezekiel 37 that is practical for us. Just as their hope was in God and the resurrection of the Israelite nation, we have hope in Jesus and the final resurrection. Our hope is in Christ. 1 Timothy 1 verse 1, Colossians chapter 1 verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory, but ultimately our hope in Christ is in the resurrection. What hope, what joy does Christ give me that after this life is over, I will arise out of the grave and I will live with God in eternity. Notice what Paul says about this hope and the essentiality of it in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19. The scripture says, If only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Paul is taking the negative and he says, if, if all you've got right now is this life, you're living a pitiful life. Well, friend, Christians are not living that pitiful life. We have hope in Christ beyond the here and now. And so from Ezekiel 37, we understand and we clearly realize there's always hope if we put our trust in God. Have you put your trust in the living and powerful God? Have you submitted to His will? Have you obeyed the gospel, friend? Are you a member of the Lord's church? You might say, well, what do I need to do to obey the gospel, to submit to God? You first must hear the word of God. Romans 10, 17. You must believe that Jesus is Son of God and Savior of the world. John 8, 24. You must be willing to repent. Luke 13, 3, make that good confession, Acts chapter 8, verse 37, and you must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And then if we've done those things and we're trying to live faithful, we need to have that hope. And when things get bleak, let's remember, with God, nothing is impossible. If we trust Christ, we can always have a living hope. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.